going through okay? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for still giving me the opportunity to talk, even though I couldn't make it in person, having some visa troubles, which I'm sure many of you were uh, familiar with, uh, struggling with those. So I um, hope you've all had a, a great uh, meeting. So uh, this is going to fit very th uh, thematically well with the previous talk, because I'm going to be talking quite a bit about what we've been doing in splicing, although um, less thinking about connections to, to chromatin. So my lab, like uh, many labs in genetics, is interested in this question broadly of how can variation at the DNA level end up contributing to human phenotypes like genetic disease risk. Of course, we think this must happen through cellular intermediates um, that operate at the molecular level. One of the phenotypes that we're very interested in is RNA splicing. And I don't need to introduce that since you've uh, got that loaded into working memory from the previous talk. And so alternative splicing can result in differences in trait outcomes. And I'm going to talk about two projects that sort of span this figure. So one is going to be trying to understand genetic effects on splice factor binding. I'm not going to have time in 30 minutes to talk about what we've been doing on an approach to looking at splicing variation transcriptome wide, uh, sort of splicing modules approach. But I will tell you about work we're doing on causal network inference to try and connect these sort of intermediate phenotypes to um, organism level phenotypes. So the kind of starting point for this work was that one of the projects I worked on during my postdoc was uh, this splicing quantification algorithm called LeafCutter, which does short read analysis from RNA sequencing data and gives a very flexible and scalable approach. So the basic idea is illustrated here. So if you have some little genomic region where black blocks here are corresponding to the constitutive exons of a gene and white blocks to alternative exons or exon extensions. The spliced reads you might see in the region might look something like this. And what LeafCutter does is to construct this intron graph where nodes correspond to starts and ends of splice junctions detected in the RNA sequencing data. And the, uh, the, the core thing that LeafCutter does is to look for these connected components. I think probably all of you for this audience know what a connected component is. And then the quantification we use is to ask how many spliced reads map to each splice junction relative to the other splice junction in the same connected component. We have some statistical machinery based on a Dirichlet multinomial generalized linear model to test for splicing differences between different conditions or different genotypes. So we and others have used LeafCutter to detect thousands of what are called splicing QTLs, so associations between common genetic variation and splicing outcomes. This is a figure from the most recent GTEx paper who used LeafCutter for their main splicing analysis. And we and others have also shown that splicing QTLs are often just as enriched or even sometimes more enriched than eQTLs in GWAS. This, is, for example, is for multiple sclerosis. It depends which trait you look at, which way this goes, but the big picture is you don't want to ignore SQTLs when you're looking at the effect of non-coding variation. But how are these variants actually affecting splicing? So I took this figure from, uh, again, the most recent GTEx paper, and here they looked at which regions in the, in the genome splicing QTLs and eQTLs are enriched in. And as you might expect, eQTLs are enriched in promoters, and splicing QTLs are enriched in actually at the splice donor and the splice acceptor and in known splice regions. And for eQTLs, you do see this weak enrichment in transcription factor binding sites, but noticeably missing from this figure is anything about splice factors or RBPs more, more broadly. And we that's surprising because you know, our understanding of how splicing is regulated is that it's through a combination of cis-acting RNA sequences in the precursor messenger RNA itself, and then transacting RNA binding protein splice factors. So this is a complicated picture, but there are these exonic splicing enhancers, it's splicing silencers, and equivalent intronic um, elements as well. 
And there's been surprisingly little work trying to look at whether there are SNPs that affect RBP binding and might, might therefore be affecting splicing downstream. There is a notable exception, which is this paper from Grace Zell's group, which looked at a large collection of uh, what's called eclip uh, profiling of different RBPs in two different cell types. So eclip is sort of the chip seek of um, RBP binding. And by counting at heterozygote SNPs in these two cell lines, by counting the number of reads coming from each allele, they could perform a statistical test asking whether there seemed to be a genetic effect on RBP binding affinity. And they were able to find a decent number of these SNPs that do seem to affect RBP binding. But of course, they're pretty limited because they can only look at heterozygote SNPs in these two cell lines. So we thought maybe a way to go further than this would be to pool multiple cell lines from different individuals. And we were inspired to do this by work from Hunter Fraser's group at Stanford, who've done a similar approach for looking at transcription factor binding effects using ChIP-seq, and they've also had follow-up work using ATTACK-seq and looking at DNA methylation as well. And there's a couple of reasons that this works out very nicely. So one is that if you're interested in common genetic variation, you actually don't need to pool very many individuals to capture a large proportion of common variants. So this is based on just uh, genotype data from GTEx, but then we're going to end up using nine, uh, pooling nine individuals. And you can see that you actually get almost 95% of common SNPs represented, even at this relatively small seeming sample size. Of course, partly we're being helped here by the fact that we happen to be a diploid species. And also this is just considering uh, SNPs at at least 5% minor allele frequency. So this isn't gonna work for rare variants. The other really nice aspect of this is that we sort of naturally control for the technical variation that's the bane of large scale sequencing experiments, especially for functional genomics, because all of the experiment is being done together. So, the way this is going to work is we're pooling uh, induced pluripotent stem cells uh, provided to us by Kristen Brennan's lab at Yale. And then we do RNA immunoprecipitation and sequencing, or RIP-seq. Uh, this is a sort of competitor method to eclip. We're doing this mainly because my postdoc, Megan Scherzer, who uh, is driving this project, had generated beautiful RIP-seq data during her uh, PhD. And so this is a protocol we were very comfortable with. We also think it actually has some advantages as well in terms of specificity. So we, if you focus on the cyan tracks here, these two are our data and the, this bottom row is from uh, ENCODE. We see rough agreement in where peaks are. Our peaks are broader, which in this setting can actually be good for capturing more SNPs and potentially more specific. So you see less non-specific binding outside of um, clear peak regions. Once we have our RIP-seq data from our pool, then we can try to assess whether there's allele-specific binding. One fun thing you can do with this sort of experiment is from the sequencing data itself, you can get an estimate of how much each individual is represented in the actual pool. And we aim for that to be even across the different individuals, but it's impossible to guarantee that in practice. So the way this works is to fit the simple linear regression, where y here is going to be the allelic ratio, or maybe I should call this a proportion for SNP i. And then the x's here are going to be the dosage for individual i, and, sorry, individual j and SNP i, coded as 0 for homozygous reference, 0 0.5 for heterozygote, and 1 for the homozygote uh, alternate. And these betas, once we fit this model, will end up corresponding to the proportion that individual J contributed to the pool. When we run this on the two biological replicates we have, we see very good consistency regardless of which um, sequencing output we look at. So here there are three different uh, immunoprecipitations that we did. So for HNRPK, HNRPA1, and RBFOX2. And importantly, also you do it. We, you would you always do an input to control for expression variation. So this is effectively just a total RNA sequencing run. Um, I'm not going to talk about the IgG. This is to control for non-specific binding. We have sort of a 
internal control by accident here and that this cell line actually wasn't included in this biological replicate. And so it should be at zero. So this gives you some sense of what the um, estimation error is here. Um, of course, you couldn't really have negative proportions of a cell line. So we, uh, we have an improved version now where we can strain the, those betas to be positive. And so that, that effect uh, goes away. So the main challenge in analyzing this data is that we want to distinguish allele-specific expression effects from allele-specific binding of the RBP. The way we do this is in a Bayesian probabilistic model, which I'll try to briefly describe. So from those estimated proportions, those betas and the genotype data that we have for the lines, we have what we think is a pretty accurate estimate of the allelic ratio of the, for the two alleles for each SNP at the DNA level. And then we model the unobserved true allelic ratio in the RNA input as being beta distributed with mean equal to the allelic ratio in the DNA, and then some concentration parameter, which controls how different they're going to be globally. And this is to model allele specific expression. So is one allele transcribed more than the other, or it could be effect on decay rate as well. The data that we have that's informative about this allelic ratio are the allelic counts in the RNA input. We model those as being beta binomial distributed with mean equal to this R and a dispersion parameter D. Then this is sort of the interesting bit from the uh, statistical, point of, statistical point of view and, and the biology is whether there are allele specific binding effects. So that would correspond to the true allelic ratio in the IP data being different to the allelic ratio in the input. And again, we use a beta distribution here with a mean equal to the allelic ratio of the RNA level um, and a, another concentration parameter that's going to be learned from the data. And then we, uh, the data that we have that's informative about the allelic ratio in the IP are the allelic counts for the IP. And again, we use a beta binomial distribution here with another dispersion parameter. So reasonably complicated probabilistic model, um, but we were able to fit this uh, very efficiently using Pyro, which is a probabilistic programming language which sits on top of PyTorch and gives you all the advantages that deep learning gets of you know, GPU-based computation and so on. We then have a statistical test uh, based on a z-score. And for HNRMPK, which is the RBP where we've done the most, the deepest sequencing, we estimate that over 7,000 SNPs show allele-specific binding effects, and that's about 2% of testable SNPs. Um, for comparison, the Hunter Fraser's work looking at transcription factors in a similar way was also estimating between 1% and 2% of testable SNPs having effects on transcription factor binding, um, de depending on which specific transcription factor you're looking at. This is the 10% uh, FDL. Of course, what we're really interested in doing with this is asking whether these SNPs that affect RBP binding seem to have downstream effects on splicing. And the way we're doing that is through a statistical genetics approach. So we're taking leaf cutter splicing QTLs from IPSCs from this nice meta-analysis, doing statistical fine mapping. So this gives you per variant posterior inclusion probabilities. So probability that a specific SNP is the actual causal SNP for a splicing change. And then we use a simple weighted lo logistic regression, which I can talk about more if people are interested, to estimate enrichment of these different features. So we have a couple of control features, whether the SNP is genic, whether it's exonic, whether it falls in the binding peak for HNRMPK. And then finally, whether it's called as a allele-specific binding QTL. And all of these get positive and significant coefficients. And this is a regression model, so these effects are additive. So a SNP that is in a binding peak has, is more likely to affect splicing than otherwise. But if it's also called as a ASB QTL, then it has a considerably greater chance of influencing splicing. So we're very pleased to see that. Um, and we're following up on this, looking at other um, splice factors and um, also uh, using more individuals as well. So 
The second vignette I want to talk about is around causal network inference. So probably many of you are aware of Mendelian randomization since it's being quite widely used in human genetics now. And the basic idea is to use SNPs as what are called instrumental variables to deal with this issue that if you're trying to ask whether a specific exposure X causally affects an outcome Y, you're always worried about confounders U. So in MR, if you're willing to make the assumption that your SNPs do not affect the confounder and only affect the outcome via the exposure, then you can get an estimate of this uh, beta, the causal effect of X on Y. And you can even relax this assumption a little bit that there's no other paths from the SNP to the outcome when you have in the situation where you have multiple SNPs. And so the most widely used approach is called Egger regression. Basically, you plot on the x-axis the association between the instrument and the exposure, the y-axis, the association between the instrument and the outcome, and the slope of this ends up being a robust estimate of beta. But in reality, we don't normally just have two traits that we're interested in exposure and outcome. In reality, phenotypes and traits live in complex directed networks where there are biomarkers and diseases and gene expression and also unmeasured confounders. So how do we think about trying to do Mendelian randomization in this, in this more sort of realistic setting? So we came up with a relatively simple linear model, which we think captures a lot of what you'd want to capture in these networks. So here, this is phenotype J is given by effects from other phenotypes through this graph G, and then by genetic effects. So X here would be genotype and beta being uh, regression coefficients. Finally, gamma would represent unmeasured confounding. And we can change this into matrix notation as shown here. And what we're really interested in doing is asking whether we can separate out direct effects of one trait on another versus mediated effects through that network. And in the case where you have the, this R matrix, the total effect matrix. So this is the true underlying effect of A on B for every pair of traits A and B, including direct effects that are mediated through the network. And uh, then under the model I just showed you, it turns out you can calculate exactly analytically G, this matrix of direct effects using this expression, where here D is just a, a term, don't need to worry about too much, this is a normalization factor. The interesting part really here is this inverse this matrix inverse. So if you've seen um, Gaussian graphical models, the graphical lasso before, this might look a little familiar. This is very analogous to converting um, correlations to partial correlations, where you're conditioning on other uh, variables in your network. There are two problems with this though. The first is even in the best case scenario, not all traits are going to be observed. So we need to worry about uh, what gets called correlated pleiotropy. So those are confounders that ha themselves have a genetic component. And we, I'm not gonna go into it in any detail, but we recently published a paper with a very straightforward extension to Egger regression that copes with this. There are also some elegant um, mixture model based approaches to solving this problem um, that are more computationally in intensive, but work better in some scenarios, although also worse than others. The second problem is we don't know, we can't even, we. We don't know the exact total causal effect matrix. We just have an estimate of it, R hat. And unfortunately, this is not one of these situations where you can just plug in an estimator and have everything work out nicely. And the reason for that is this matrix inverse is not very stable. So you can imagine this can, if there's uh, a lot of noise contributing to small eigenvalues uh, or singular values in here, then those are going to get amplified by the matrix inverse. The solution we came up with was to use this convex optimization formulation of this problem. So here, R is our total effect matrix or our estimate of it from Mendelian randomization. V is going to be an approximate matrix inverse of R. And that is specified via this loss. And then we have this regularization, which so this is a lasso or graphical lasso-like regularization 
um, so it puts an L1 penalty, L1 penalty on every element of V. And we set this up in this slightly convoluted way. So by uh, constraining that matrix U times matrix V has to be equal to the identity, because it lets us use this optimization approach called alternating direction method and multipliers, which is a very elegant approach for solving these sort of biconvex optimization problems. We have these weights W, which let us account for standard errors coming from the MR. We have a stability criterion adapted from a similar approach to graphical lasso for lambda. And the connections of graphical lasso, are, which gives you undirected networks, so is a lot of why we're sort of, um, we think this approach makes a lot of sense. We've done an, a large number of, oh, I should say Breelin really, has done a large number of uh, simulations generating random graphs with different um, characteristics and also different ways of orienting the edges. And we seem to be broadly robust to the sort of network, how the network uh, looks. And it's an interesting problem because there aren't very obvious baselines to compare to, but the sort of simple baselines we can come up with, we perform much better than. The big uh, sort of real world application we've done with this is to look at the UK Biobank. So we end up looking at just over 400 traits based on various filters. Out of those, around 5% have significant total causal effects on each other. And those 8,000 or so total causal effects are explained by a direct effect network that we estimate that has just under 3,000 edges. And then we can start to look at interesting properties of that directed network. So we can see that most nodes have no causal effects, but there are hub nodes that have a very large number of downstream effects, for example, uh, BMI. We also see very high connectivity. So any node which influences or that affects at least one other node can affect any node in the network eventually by propagating effects through the network. We also see very per pervasive mediation. So if you take a pair of nodes, pair of traits that have a significant total causal effect between them, the median path length is actually two. So that says it's more common that when you see an effect of A on B, it's through an effect on C rather than being direct. And also the shortest path between two nodes on average only explains 52% of variance. So there's, if A affects B, there's often two paths through the network in which through which A affects B. The direction we're going with this project is to try to think about using it to estimate the directed gene regulatory networks underlying complex traits. And to do this, we need large scale trans, EQTL, and SQTL uh, mapping. To do that, in collaboration with Tofik Raj's lab at Mount Sinai, we've been collating and uniformly processing all the publicly available post mortem brain RNA sequencing data we can get our hands on calling trans EQTLs. And we think that the sort, of, the sort of sample sizes, we're getting to around five or 6,000 individuals, we should start to see a significant number of trans EQTLs, and that does seem to be, to be playing out. And this connects to work from my old lab at Stanford uh, around the omnigenic, proposed omnigenic model that says that maybe one of the reasons many traits look so polygenic is that the gene regulatory networks are so densely connected you can perturb almost any gene in the network and that effect will eventually propagate on to the trait that you're looking at. So um, acknowledgements here should mostly go to Megan and Breland, who did the bulk of this work. Um, and I'm very happy to take questions. I'm good. Thank you, David. It was also clear. <laughs> Thank you very much for showing up. No problem. Glad it's a good. It's a one plus of the pandemic is that uh, this stuff runs a lot more smoothly these days because we're all used to doing it. So.